It was an interesting journey to get to this pulpit this week because I wasn't supposed to preach today. Pastor Anastasia was on the schedule and on Monday I had uh, chapel for the first day of school and um, then we had staff meeting and as Pastor Anastasia and I met for staff meeting she said how would you like to trade me preaching appointments? How would you like to preach this week and I'll preach another week for you? And my response was, no. I preached two weeks in a row, it's your turn. You haven't been in the pulpit for a few weeks. So we finished our staff meeting. Later on that day, I was still, still here at the office I ran down the hallway and I was reflecting on what I had said in chapel for the students. And by the way, for those of you who were here for that chapel, I'm just sharing a bit of that chapel this morning, so it's not a total repeat of that chapel, so don't worry. But as I was just reflecting on what I had said, suddenly this sermon wrote itself within 10 minutes. When that happens, I pay attention because usually preparing sermons is a process. Blood and guts process sometimes. Sometimes it it flows out so easily and sometimes it's just such hard work. This sermon outline wrote itself in 10 minutes, which so rarely happens. Now, I've spent... Since then, I've spent six or eight hours fleshing it out and doing my research. But when, it, when something comes to me that way, I have to pay attention. And so on Tuesday, I told Anastasia, if you want to trade with me for September the 4th, I'm in. Because perhaps the Lord has something in this sermon that he wanted me to share with you today. I don't know why, but I do try to pay attention to the Lord when he gives me impressions. So I just want to start off by telling you about my daughter, Allison, my oldest child. When she was a toddler, she did not like to get dirty. She had a phobia against being dirty. We should get something on her clothes. This is before she could really talk. But when she'd get something on her clothes, we would hear this, uh, uh, and she would start trying to take off those clothes that were dirty. She did not like to be dirty. Her clothes or her hands. We were living in Philadelphia at the time, and we were so thankful that someone who had lived in the house we were living in many years before had planted a raspberry patch. And so every spring when we were there, we enjoyed the fruit of their planting the raspberry patch. And so we would go out into the raspberry patch. It wasn't a very big one, so there really wasn't enough to pick and freeze or anything like that. It was just enough to pick and maybe have for breakfast or just go out and pick and eat it right off the vine. Just really, really ripe and fresh. And so we would take Allison out and we taught her how to pick the raspberries. And she would pick a raspberry and she'd put it in her mouth. And then she would look at her fingers and go, uh because raspberry stain, I mean, almost, you almost can't pick one without staining your hand. I mean, they're so soft and they're so juicy. And, and she would pick one and go, eh. didn't like her hand being dirty. And so she developed a new method. <laughs> she would pick the raspberry off the vine with her lips. She didn't have to get her hand dirty. She couldn't see if her lips got stained. Brilliant. We always thought it was so hilarious. 
Now, it's interesting to me that as an adult, she's outgrown that, and she's really quite a gardener. In her house are 50, 60 indoor plants. I mean, she loves to garden. She loves to get her hands dirty now in the, in the soil. But it was not so then. Now, I, I know it's not so uncommon for many people to not like to get their hands dirty. It's not that uncommon. But I'm so happy to tell you today that I serve a God who has dirty hands. And I'm thankful for that. What I shared when, or, or Monday, rather, when we went to chapel was uh, this idea about the beginning of all things, the creation of the world. Uh, if you have your Bible there, you can turn with me to Genesis chapter 1. <clears throat> We start off with God creating the heavens and the earth. Verse 3 says, And God said, Let there be light. Boom! Bang! There was light. God spoke. And bang! It happened. I saw a, a bumper sticker some time ago that said, I believe in the Big Bang Theory. Do you believe in the Big Bang Theory? I believe in the Big Bang Theory. God spoke and bang! It happened. Let there be light. God spoke and it happened. In Psalm 33, verses 6 and 9. We read about God's creation. Psalm 33. Turn on there with your devices. Turn your Bible. Psalm 33. Verse 6, it says, By the word of the Lord the heavens were made, and by the breath of his mouth all their host. Verse 9, For he spoke, and it came to be. He commanded, and it stood fast. God's creative word. He, he spoke, and it happened. The second day, he spoke, let there be a firmament, and this earth was surrounded by an atmospheric envelope. The third day, he spoke and said, let there be dry land, and bang, and the dry land appeared. The fourth day, he said, let there be the sun, moon, and stars, and they appeared. The fifth day, he spoke, and the, and the oceans were teeming with sea life, and the sky was teeming with birds. Their sound, their, their songs, immediately began to be heard. God spoke, and bang, it happened. The sixth day, God spoke and said, let there be animals upon the earth. And so God spoke, and the earth brought forth all the wonderful creation we see around us. God spoke. He spoke creation into existence. But he didn't speak man into existence. I just, when I was preparing for that worship talk, I realized that. It was like, wow, I don't know why I really kind of never noticed that before. But all the rest of the creation, God spoke and it stood fast. But when it came to man, he changed his modus operandi. His method of operation. Genesis 1.26, and it says, Then God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, male and female. He created them. It's significant, folks. Of all the rest of the creation, God spoke and it stood fast, but when it came to mankind, he changed Genesis 2 tells us exactly what he actually did. Genesis 2, chapter 7. It says, 
Then the Lord formed the man from the dust of the ground. He changed. Instead of speaking, he used his hands. He got his hands dirty, so to speak. It's interesting that this word that's used for form in the Hebrew is a word that's often used for the work of a potter. It's the same word when the potter forms the pot. God formed man from the dust of the ground, from the dirt, from the clay of the earth. With his own hands. God got his hands dirty. I've done some pottery throwing in my time. I love it. If I weren't so busy, I'd want to have another class because I like to do it so much. And I've done it, and when 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 you start working with that clay, you have to use plenty of water, but not too much water, right, Therese? Plenty of water, and and, and your hands start getting really grimy and dirty and slippery. And some of you have done this. And if you've got the wheel going too fast, the, the dirty water will actually come out off the wheel and get on your clothes. You get dirty. And God got his hands dirty. We are a special creation from God. But somehow, God could not speak us into existence, but he had to put the fingerprints of deity upon mankind. We are formed in the image of God. We are not an accident. We are not the 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 product of some we are not the product of some some mechanism of of evolution. We are not by natural selection. We are formed in the image of God, a special creation from God's own hand. When I was in Jordan almost 20 years ago now on an archaeological dig, I went down to the Dead Sea to an area um, where, where there's uh, some ancient cities. One of them's called Bab a very ancient city, about 2,200 BC, so 4,200 years old, and there's this huge cemetery where they have tens of thousands of ancient pottery vessels, one of my very favorite archeological sites in the world. I have a few ancient vessels from that site. But while I was there, I was walking around the cemetery and I found this piece of pottery. Now, I wish you could see it up close, But it's just the bottom of a piece of pottery. It was made before the wheel was made. So this is a hand-formed piece of pottery. And what I noticed immediately when I saw it down on the ground, the atmosphere around us is about 110 degrees. It's It's a horribly hot place. And I'm walking around this cemetery, and it looks like a desert. And I see this this little pottery shirt on the ground, and I look at it. And I see in this pottery shirt fingerprints. You can actually see in this pottery shirt where probably the woman, the fingers look quite small, where she formed this pot, this ancient piece of pottery. And when I, now all of you wouldn't get this, my wife doesn't get this, by the way, but when I put my fingers into these, into these indentations, I somehow connect myself with this ancient woman. Her fingerprints, 4,200 years old fingerprints. Well, when God made man, he left his fingerprints. His fingerprints are upon me, they're upon you. We are made in the image of God. God, in order to, to make us, in order to create us, He put his fingerprint on humanity. We, David says in the Psalms, we are the work of his hands. In order to create mankind, God had to get his hands dirty. But this is not the last time in order to help mankind that God had to get his hands 
dirty. He is a God who has dirty hands. Why? Because he loves humanity. He wanted to create us with those dirty hands. But after getting his hands dirty with us, he didn't just walk away. Salvation history is full of the story of how God continued to get his hands dirty literally, figuratively, ritually. It's the history of salvation. Let me give you a few examples. Now, as I was walking along in the hallway and I was writing this sermon in my brain, I rushed to my office and I, and in essence, told David, don't bother me, I've got to write this down while it's in my brain. So I wrote, I wrote these notes down and this is the first one that came to my mind, the first illustration of how God continued to get his hands dirty, Matthew chapter 8. Matthew chapter 8. Verses 2 and 3. It's a story of a leper. Matthew chapter 8, 2 and 3. He'd been up on the mountains. This is after the Sermon on the Mount. The Sermon on the Mount had ended in, verse, in chapter 7. And in verse 8, Jesus came down from the mountain. Great crowds followed him. Chapter 8, verse 2, it says, And behold, a leper came to him and knelt before him, saying, Lord, if you will, you can make me clean. What's the leper's problem? He's dirty. He has leprosy. He's unclean. You know, everywhere a leper went, he was supposed to yell, unclean, unclean. So no one would approach him because leprosy was very contagious. Just the act of this man coming up, approaching Jesus, and bowing down before him, just approaching human people without screaming unclean, he is breaking multiple laws by doing this. But he, he has a, a vision. He says, Lord, if, if you will, you can make me clean. If you will. Jesus had a choice to make. Verse 3. Oh, this is so beautiful. It says, And Jesus stretched out his hand and touched him, saying, I will be clean. And immediately his leprosy was cleansed. This is risky behavior. Leprosy is extremely contagious. Can you imagine all the people watching this from the side? There were all kinds of people, it says, following him, and there were scribes and Pharisees. There were Jewish people. There were other people. There were fishermen who were already unclean anyway, by the way. Fishermen ritually were always unclean. And besides that, you know fishermen have a certain air about them, right? from being with dead fish all the time. They smell a certain way. Can you just imagine Jesus starting to reach out and t touch this leper? And people going, no! You see it in slow Can you see it in slow motion? No! Maybe I have too good of an imagination. I don't know. He reaches out and he touches him. And you see what happens? The dirt that the leper had is transferred to Jesus. Jesus' hands are now dirty, but here's the good news. Do you see it? The leper's clean. I mean, Jesus gets his hands dirty for a reason. So he can save a human being. It's a beautiful story. Contrast this with the Pharisees, the Jewish sect of Pharisees, the word Pharisee means separated ones. The Pharisees were, it was important to them to be ritually pure. And so the Pharisees avoided anyone who was a sinner, uh, anyone who would possibly be unclean, uh, uh, the, the, the fishermen were always unclean, so they wouldn't be around fishermen. Anyone that was unclean, as a matter of fact, 
A Pharisee was so intent upon being ritually pure that when a Pharisee went into the market, when they got home from the market, they took their clothes off and took a bath. Because while they were in the market, they might have rubbed elbows with someone who was impure and it would have made them impure. So they had to take a shower when they got, uh, not a shower, <laughs> had to take a bath. There was a special ritual bath called a mikvah that they had to uh, disrobe and go into the mikvah, just walk through it, but it cleansed them ritually. They had to do that. So imagine the contrast between these people who wouldn't even approach a sinner and Jesus who reaches out and touches the leper because Jesus knew that in order to cleanse mankind, sometimes he had to get his hands dirty. John chapter 9. <clears throat> when I began looking for stories to illustrate this idea, I thought, oh, I'll, I'll find a few, and there are so many I can't even tell you about them all today. Um, John chapter 9. Now, this is a strange story. This is a story of a healing that takes, part in, takes place in two parts. This is different than the one we just saw where Jesus, bang, it's done. This was different. Uh, John chapter 9, verse 6. He meets this, they meet this blind man. And the, the disciples say, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents? that he was born blind. That's important, and we'll come back to that. So what does Jesus do? He approaches the man, verse 6, he spat on the ground and made mud with the saliva. Now this would not work in today's world. He spat on the ground and made mud with the saliva. Then he anointed the man's eyes with the mud and said to him, go wash in the pool of Siloam. Literally, he got his hand dirty this time. This, before, he got his hands dirty ritually and contagiously, but this time he literally gets his hands muddy and he spits on the ground does anybody find this just kind of gross? <laughs> he spits on the grave. He makes mud in his hand, puts it in his hand, and then he puts it on, on the guy's eyes. I, I call this guy Mr. Muddy Eyes. Now, here's the question. Why didn't Jesus just say, be healed? Because this man needed more than that. He needed to feel the touch of Jesus because, remember the question? I'll come back to the question. Who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? You know, this man was looked, under, looked upon as being a great sinner or his parents were a great sinner because he was blind. And Jesus touches him and gives him love and acceptance. He touches him. And then the, this, the verse ends... Verse six, or verse seven. So he went and washed and came back seeing. Jesus knew that in order to save humanity, he had to sometimes get his hands dirty. Back to the book of Matthew. Matthew 9. <clears throat> we have the story of a woman who approaches Jesus. She's suffering from a bleeding condition. She is ritually impure, according to the scribes and Pharisees. Ritually impure. And, and this one's a little different because in this case, Jesus doesn't touch her. What? She touches him. And when she touched him, she made him ritually impure. But it didn't matter to Jesus that he had been made ritually impure. He looks around and says to her, take heart, your faith has made you whole. 
And Jesus got his hands dirty without even touching her. But he healed her. The next story, actually remember the story is that when he's on his way to another healing, he, he's touched by this woman. The next story in, the, in, this, in, in Matthew 9 is the story of the little girl that he heals. The ruler had come and said, my little girl has died. Lord, please, please come and heal her. This is a ruler of the Jews. And Jesus goes to his house. She's just died. The law says you should not touch a dead body. But in verse 25 of Matthew 9, it says this. Verse 25. And when the crowd had been put outside, he went in and took her by the hand. And the girl arose. He knew that in order to save the girl's life, he had to get his hands dirty by taking away from her the curse of death and restoring her to life. You know, this afternoon, if you want a little assignment, if you a little homework assignment, go look, at, go look for some other stories. There are a bunch of other stories in which you can illustrate how Jesus had to get his hands dirty so he could cleanse humanity. Mark chapter 7 has one that I'm still puzzling over, so I'm not even going to tell you about it, but go back and read it. Mark 7, it's a strange story. Strange story. But these are all healings of other people. But what about church members? Does Jesus need to get his hands dirty with church members? John chapter 13, remember, they're in the upper room. It's the Last Supper. His disciples have dirty feet, and that was the least of their problems. They had dirty hearts. What does Jesus do? He rises and washes their feet, getting his own hands dirty to, to try to clean their hearts. But of course, the ultimate dirty hands moment is when Jesus is carrying his cross to Calvary. And under the weight of the burden, he falls. And his hands go into the dirt of the soil same soil that he had used to create humanity. Now his hands are soiled by it. And just a few minutes later, his hands are soiled by the blood that's flowing from their very inner being, his inner being. The ultimate dirty hands moment. But the only reason he did it is because he realized that in order to cleanse humanity, he would have to have dirty hands in order to save humanity. As I was, as I was working on this sermon, I kept having this, this, this idea go through my mind, this haunting question. Why is it that God could speak creation into existence, but he could not speak salvation into existence? Think about that. He could not speak salvation into existence any more than he spoke man into existence because God does not have a remote control relationship with humanity. He has to get his hands dirty with humanity. That's how much he loves you. It wasn't enough just to speak him into existence. He had to intimately touch him and create him. And it wasn't enough that he could have clicked the remote control in heaven and saved mankind. He had to get his hands dirty. It was all foretold in Isaiah 53. Isaiah 53 had foretold about the coming of Jesus. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds, 
we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid upon him the iniquity of us all. Many, to make many to be counted a righteous, righteous. Isaiah says, he shall bear their iniquities. I have bad news for you. The bad news is that we have naturally dirty hands. We're sinners. And there's nothing we can do about it. And we hold these messes in our hands. We need help. But here's the good news. God reaches out and he gets his hands dirty with your mess. so that you can have clean hands and a clean heart and have a chance to live for an eternity because he has dirty hands i can have clean ones he's got us in his hands he will never let us go I was thinking about this song He's got the whole world in his hands. It's an old spiritual. Can you imagine this? Just think about it. You know where the spirituals came from. They came from the slaves in the south who as they were working in the fields, as they were working for their master, as they were working picking cotton or working processing whatever the master told them to do, they would sing these songs. They brought them hope. They brought them faith. They, it gave them something to do. It united them. And just think of these words of this slave. who We don't know who wrote this song, but it came from this setting. This slave who's out in the fields and starts singing this song his life is out of control. Her life is out of control. Her life, his life is not their own. Their future is unknown. And it's going to be hard. And think of the audacious faith for that slave in the field to start singing that song. He's got the whole world in his hands. How could they possibly believe that? How could they believe that there's hope beyond what they can see evidently right away? How can they hope that? It's faith. They had that faith. We should have that faith today. You know, we look around at all of the troubles in our world. We look at the ways we mess our own hands up, the mess that we hold in our own hands and in our own hearts. We need the assurance. We need the assurance that he's got the whole world in his hands. And because of that, his hands are dirty. But he's got the whole world in his hands. And the price of our salvation is his dirty hands. But with them, he gains eternity with us, for us. It's the price of our salvation. Sing with me, please.